have your Bible, turn with me to the Gospel of John this morning, please. The Gospel of John. Chapter number 19 and verse number 13. The Apostle John. The Apostle of the Bible said that Jesus loved. Special love for John. He loved all of his disciples, but he had a special love for John, folks. John 19 and verse 13. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth, set him down the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he saith to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore to them to be crucified. They took Jesus, led him away, and he bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side one and Jesus in the midst. Father, bless this holy book now, Lord. Another privilege that I have, a great privilege, a great opportunity to stand and be a messenger this morning one more time. In thy holy name, amen. You can be seated. If you ever go to Jerusalem, you go outside the, the uh, northern gate. It's called the Damascus Gate. Look across the street and you'll see an Arab bus station. Right above it, you'll see a... A, uh, a uh, rock formation that certainly resembles a skull. Off to the left of that, as you face it, to the left-hand side of it, there is a garden tomb. And so the garden tomb is in very close proximity to the rock formation. General Charles Gordon, back in the early 1900s, British general, looked across the walls of Jerusalem and saw that over there, and he said, that looks to me like Golgotha. And uh, so they call it Gordon's Calvary to this very day, uh, named after that British general. And uh, I'm not here today to establish archaeological evidence, but I've been that, to that location six times, and there's something about it. It's quite remarkable. A few years ago, a Muslim took a hammer and climbed up there and tried to bust the nose section out of that rock formation and was successful in knocking some of it out, but it's still there, and it's still Golgotha. And it's still the place where Christ was crucified. And the old Jews say, the old Jewish rabbis have a tradition that Adam was created on the very spot where Christ was crucified. That may be true. We can't say it's not. It is Jewish tradition. But there's one thing for certain. There is in Jerusalem a place where the Lord God Almighty came down and became a man. And there died on a cross so that we could be saved. Amen. This morning I'm going to preach you a message on four separate perspectives of that cross as seen by four different groups of people. And I want to begin with God Almighty, God the Father, who offered up His Son on the cross at Calvary, and there He gave His life so that we could be saved. First of all, that cross, therefore, from God's perspective, becomes an altar. Outside the tabernacle, they had the brazen altar, and it was there that the sacrifices were made. No sacrifice in life was taken inside the holy place. That was all done outside. The blood was shed outside. Then when the priest entered into the holy place, he came in there with blood that had already been shed. There he was able, by virtue of that bloodshed, to approach into God. It was there the Lord Jesus Christ became the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. For it was at the cross at Calvary that he shed his precious blood. The Bible says in the book of John chapter number one, and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again the next day after John stood, two of his disciples, looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, behold the Lamb of God. When God looked at the cross at Calvary, he saw the mercy seat. The Bible said in the book of Exodus chapter number 25, thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. What is the mercy seat, preacher? It is the place where God meets man. Therefore, my dear friend, if you try to skirt, get around, do away with the cross, you'll never meet God on this earth. He'll meet you at Calvary. In the book of Exodus chapter 25, he said, 
There will I meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two terabims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I give thee in commandment unto the children <coughs> of Israel. When God looked at the cross, he saw a message. My friend, I want you to understand something this morning. Romans chapter number 5 and verse 6 says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You can go to Buddha, he didn't die for you. You can go to Muhammad, he didn't die for you. You can go to Confucius, he didn't die for you. You can go to all of the religions, every last Hindu god of the millions that they have. Not a one of them died for you. We have this morning, as the faith of Christ, the only religion on the face of this earth that has one that dies for you. The Lord Jesus Christ died for you. Nobody else has anything like that in their faith. And then finally, when the Lord God looked at the cross at Calvary, he looked down and saw an intercessor and a mediator. The Bible said in Luke chapter number 23, then said, Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God the Father saw his son as he spoke forth from the tree and he became an intercessor. Not only that, he became a mediator. For in that statement are two things tied up. Number one, Father, forgive them. That's the cry of an intercessor. That is someone that cries out for you before Almighty God. And some of you in this house today are interceding for those who cannot intercede for themselves. Some of these kids cannot pray for themselves. Some of these parents cannot pray for themselves. If you are a mature Christian, you should be able to tell when someone is so out of fellowship with God and not walking with the Lord, that they're not praying anymore. That should be an impetus for you to begin to pray. But the second part of this is what he said. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That, my dear friend, is the cry of a mediator. They don't know what they're doing. The Lord Jesus Christ said, Father, forgive them, for they're ignorant, they're blind, they're not following light. They're following deception. They're in darkness and therefore they're nailing me to a tree. Oh, thank God for that mediator. The Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. Amen. He can take your heart before the very heart of God like nobody else can. He mediates a holy God that cannot look upon sin. A holy God that cannot touch you a sinner has a link, a bridge, a ladder between heaven and earth. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ, the mediator between God and men. So from God's perspective, he's an altar, a mercy seat, a message, and an intercessor. The cross is seen from the spirit world as a different thing. The Bible said in Colossians chapter number two, in you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled the principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. When these evil spirits gathered around the cross, and make no mistake, they did. When the Lord Jesus Christ was hanging on that tree, and the earth and the heavens turned dark, at quiet high noon, from nine o'clock in the morning until three that afternoon, he hung on the tree for six long hours. He suffered pure physical hell. But for the last three hours, nobody saw anybody. You couldn't even see the hand before your face. But they heard a cry, and they heard it in the darkness. And that cry reached up to heaven. And that cry said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? No doubt Satan had said to himself when he heard that, we'll break him now. We'll break him now. He's reached the point where God was, is no longer with him. We'll break him now. And Satan knew that if he could break him on the cross, he would, he would break your soul. He would, he would send all of us to an eternal damnation. For there is no Savior outside the Lord Jesus Christ. So Satan and demons and everything that hell had to offer came against him on the tree. And it was in the weakest hour. It was 
when he was the weakest. The Bible said he was crucified in weakness. It was there on the cross at Calvary. In the darkness, it was not only dark physically, my, how dark it was spiritually. For God Almighty manifested the flesh was dying. Can't you imagine what it was when he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It was between that cry that said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That God withdrew from his son and allowed him to hang alone on that tree. And the only thing that sustained him until he cried his last breath was his faith in God, was his trust in the Father. He did trust him. He knew he would he, he knew he could trust him. And from his heart and from his soul, God let him look down where he was headed when he carried our sins who became sin that knew no sin at Calvary God opened up the very wrath of God and let his son look into the abyss my dear friend understand something a price was paid for your soul that is beyond description and we'll never know how great that price is until we get to glory we'll never know we'll never understand but I'll tell you this the spirit the spirit world watched, the spirit world waited with breath abated, and they wanted to see him destroyed on the cross at Calvary. But the last thing they heard out of his mouth was, Father, 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 into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so the angels rejoiced, and so the archangels rejoiced, and so the spirit world rejoiced when they saw the Lord Jesus Christ as he gave his soul and his spirit unto God the Father and the demonic forces of hell with Satan and all that went with him must have had a death blow struck to them for the Bible says in Colossians he made a show of them openly and that was at the cross at Calvary no man could see the spiritual battle that went on on that tree most people in the church house today cannot see the spiritual battle that's going on in this house when these kids get up here and talk about the temptations and the kind of world that they're living in and what they have to face on a daily basis. Most of my generation have no idea of the kind of world that they have to grow up in now. I wouldn't want to be 17 years old growing up in America right now. Make no mistake about it. I would not want to be 17 years old in this culture today. The forces of hell that are arrayed against kids is unbelievable. It's coming at them and it wants their soul. It wants to drag them down to the pit. It wants to destroy them. And the only power you have over them is what happened at the cross at Calvary. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So as seen from the spirit world, you get a mixed bag. The cross from man's perspective. The men were gathered around and the women were gathered around the cross. The cat calls and the hollering and the screaming. Oh, how you could have heard it. And no doubt other things that were being done while he was hanging on the tree. Things that are unspeakable that you don't even want to talk about. But first of all, let's look at Rome. Rome was the one who nailed him on the tree. That's the secular power and authority. He's the one that he called Caesar. At best, Caesar is is indifferent to the church of God. At its worst, Caesar is a persecutor of the church of God. Keep this in your soul and never forget it. Whether Democrat or Republican or whatever they have to do with the government, always keep this in your soul. That's Caesar. And Caesar is not the church of God. And Caesar is not the minister preaching the gospel. And you better be very careful and ask God to give you some wisdom when it comes to Caesar. If Caesar ever wants to join in with you and propagate the gospel he's got strings attached if Caesar ever comes along and wants to be part of your services you better watch him you better watch Caesar you better try the spirits Caesar was there and Caesar had nailed him to the tree I know a lot of other power and forces was involved but it was the nails of a Roman soldier that nailed him to a cross one of the worst forms of execution ever devised by a human being they meant for men to suffer it was all about suffering it was about about torment. It was about bringing hell down on the soul of a man. And so they nailed him on a tree. Oh yes, you can kill a man in a lot of ways other than crucifixion. 
And then, my dear friend, there's the mob. Who's the mob, preacher? Well, the same ones who just a few days before had cried, Hosanna to the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Do you know what the word Hosanna means in Hebrew? It means save now. They, they lauded him as their savior, as their king. But the salvation of this mob, they weren't concerned about their soul. They were concerned about their bread and their belly. They were concerned about their pocketbook. That's the salvation that most of the mob is interested in today. Stay away from the mob. He calls you one by one. Every last one of us that have ever been born again, he reached out there and he spoke to our heart one by one. And I'll tell you something, dear friend, the closer you draw to him, the further you'll get from the mob. And here's the mob's cry. Here, listen, listen to them. Listen to them. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Oh, all the vitriol, the hatred, the anger coming out from the depths of their soul. What for? Let me ask you. Why do you want to see him crucified? What's he ever done to you? Did he ever hurt anybody? Did he ever hurt a thing on this earth? When he walked here for 33 and a half years, the blessed, righteous son of the living God, the only holy one this world's ever known. Did he ever hurt anybody? No. Did he ever take anything from anybody? No. The only thing he ever did was feed the hungry. He raised the dead. He healed the sick. He walked on water. He saved the soul. Amen. He delivered the demoniac. Glory to God. Let me tell you something. I stand with Pontius Pilate. I find no fault in him. Amen. I've been examining him for a long time. I'll tell you something right now. The more I look at him, the more beautiful he gets. The more I, <laughs> the more I talk about him, the more I know about him, the more I love him. Amen. Ain't no man like the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Hallelujah. Get me out of the mob and get me alone with the Lord. Yeah. Then religious leaders were gathered that day. The Pharisees, the Pharisees, had the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, and all the rest of them, and they were all gathered around that day. They all wanted their pound of flesh. Yes, sir. They all wanted to make their statement. I'll tell you something, dear friend. It's not an amazing thing that when you see courage, the cowards come around. You ever notice how when you got one like this, you're talking about courage, dear friend. Friend. Here's one who's dying on a tree. The roach bugs come out of the corners and they come around and they want to mock and they want to make fun of him. But they didn't break him. You know why they didn't break him? They didn't break him because he was so much bigger and better than them. Far, far above them. You know what though? There's something about our nature that's so twisted and perverted. If you can't have something, you want to destroy it. Yeah, man, you want to tear down that that you didn't build. And for why do you want to do that, preacher? Because there's some kind of a perverted satisfaction in the soul of a man because he can't have it that he doesn't want anybody else to have it. But oh, when you ever know him, oh, when you ever saved, if you ever born again, you'll be walking around that cross and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians, they can be making fun and mocking, and but you can walk around around that cross and say, listen to me, let me tell you something. I'd be in hell if it wasn't for that one hanging on that tree. I deserve to go to the pit, but he's dying for me and preach the word of God to that religious crowd. You ever notice how, you ever do any reading on this stuff? Everybody's confused about who Jesus is. They are, nobody seems to get it right about who he is. Well, somebody said he's the Baptist. I don't forget the Baptist, my friend. Well, he's the Methodist. He was the, he's the Catholic. No, no, no. He's God manifest in the flesh. That's who he is to this very day. Hey, sir. And the disciples were gathered around there that day. Oh, yeah, yeah, they were. Some of them. You see, the fearful disciples had, they were gone. Amen. Ran for their lives. Do you know why they were running away? Because they hadn't had the Holy Ghost yet. Amen. Didn't have him yet. Didn't have him yet. They were running away. The only one left was John. The one he had a special love for. Right. He loved John yeah. and the women. Yeah. Boys, I tell you this, it's truth though. 
the women outdid the men at the crucifixion. Next time you want to strut around and talk about how great the men are and how, how much courage the men got you, got to deal with that one. All those Marys that were there at that cross, all those Marys, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Cleophas, Mary the mother of Christ, all those Marys were right there at the cross and only one man, John the Apostle. There they stood, there they wept, there they loved him. There their heart and their soul was poured out for him. And then when he died, they begged his body. Oh, let us have his body so that we may lay it in a virgin tomb. Amen. And then finally, here's the fourth perspective. So which one's that, preacher? Mine. Amen. That's what I see. You like to know what I think, don't you? <laughs> let me give you my perspective at the cross. First of all, when I look up at the cross at Calvary, I see one taking my place. I ought to be hanging up there. I broke every law God ever wrote. I was as sorry and loaded as I come. God found me in a sewer. I don't know where he found you. He found me in a sewer. And he dropped me up out of that thing. It's like when Jeremiah had those old rags of a cord and they reached down in the pit and they pulled him up out of that pit. That's where he found me. It was like when they took him up out of the water. It's me that they they found God saved my soul. When I look at the cross at Calvary, I see one that took my place. Here's the second thing when I look up there that I see, I see one that's dying for my sins. I thought to myself, my goodness gracious, has anybody in this house this morning committed a sin worthy of death? Amen. Amen. Well, now wait a minute, preacher. Our law, I don't care about your law. The wages of sin is. Amen. So we're all guilty. Yes, sir. Amen. Every one of us have been condemned to death. And the death that the wages of sin brings on is not the physical death of the body. It's called the second death in the Bible. What's that, preacher? You don't hear much preaching about the second death, do you? You know why? Because it reaches down past what you can see into the eternal world. And it has to do with the image of God. Whatever, whatever's left in you of the image of God will be gone completely. Nothing but a morass, a mess, a nothing to be in the pit of hell. Think about losing the very image of God. There's one thing's for certain. This is absolutely certain this morning, dear friend. You're going to die. Well, say, preacher, well, the rapture takes place, then you're going to leave. Which you'd rather have the rapture or death? How many would rather have the rapture? Shows you got a little sense. I'd rather go up in the rapture, wouldn't you? When I look at the cross at Calvary, number three, I see my Savior. I see my Savior. What's that mean, preacher? Listen, if I preached 150 years, it wouldn't save me. If I had every accolade that could be hung on me to where if I had all, the, had all the medals and I couldn't even stand up straight, that wouldn't save me. If I took every dime I've got and borrowed money, it'd take me a thousand years to pay back, that wouldn't save me. If I got on my hands and on my knees and crawled across glass, broken glass, for a hundred miles, that wouldn't save me. If I decided to live the best I knew how to live and never try to sin, never did anything I could, to, to not sin for the next hundred years. That wouldn't save me. If I joined every church in the country and in the world, signed every catechism, made every statement of confirmation, that wouldn't save me. What saves you, preacher? I want to break it down as simple as I know how for you. This is very, very important. I've heard two men now in the last few days say the same thing I've been saying for decades. And I rejoice. And it's not because I'm original with it, but it's when I hear it from somebody else, it does sound good. Both of these men said this. They said, salvation is a person. <laughs> he that hath the Son hath life. First John. He that hath not the Son hath not life. Not whether the church has confirmed you, the priest has sprinkled water on you, been baptized by the pastor, whatever. He that hath the Son hath life. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 10, so what is nigh thee, even in thy heart and in thy mouth, the word of faith which we preach? 
That if you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, do you believe that? Yes. If you believe that he died and rose again, the Bible says the word that comes out of your mouth is the faith, the faith that you believe, the faith that you trust, that you trust the Lord Jesus to save you. Yes. Romans 10, 13, yes. for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, the last time I checked it out in the dictionary, means anybody. Red man, yellow man, black man, white man, rich man, poor man, bond man, free man, big man, little man. And when I say man, I speak in the sense of mankind. He tasted death for every man. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I called on him. And I raised my head up and I was never the same again. <laughs> never. And then finally, when I look at the cross at Calvary, here's the fourth thing I see. I see God's love letter to me. Yes, sir, I do. I see God's love letter to me. Have you guys ever been in the military, the ladies? You know what mail call is? Mail call's a big deal in the military. Big deal. You ever seen anybody get a Dear John letter? I have. You know what a Dear John letter is? If you've been in the military, you know what a Dear John letter is. A Dear John letter is this if you're in the military. Well, now, honey, I still love you, but I'm not in love with you. And I found somebody else here, and uh, I, I don't want you to fret over me, worry about me, but I've got another boyfriend here, and, you know, and I, I'm, I hate to tell you this, but I've got to be honest with you. Uh, you know, when you come home, I won't be here waiting for you. That's a Dear John letter. And you're 3,000 miles away, or you're 6,000 miles away on the other end of the world. And I've seen men take 45s and blow their brains out when they get a Dear John letter. See, they can fight the enemy eyeball to eyeball, toe to toe. They can go into the face of hell and go into battle and fight. But a letter from somebody they love, they put a gun to their head and blow their brains out. You are the most vulnerable from those you love than anybody else. Dear John letter. That's an awful thing to get. I never got any Dear John letters. You want the man to do first thing a man does when he gets a mail call when he gets a letter from his sweetheart? How many of you guys in the military? They grab that letter and they... <laughs> Am I telling the truth? You spent a year and something over there in Iraq. Nothing's changed, has it? They did the same thing, didn't they? That's man, it's been over two or three years ago. What? Soldier will always be soldiers. They get a letter from their girlfriend. <laughs> and I've, had them, I've even had them bring the letter, hey, don't you smell this? <laughs> that smells good, yeah. <laughs> from their girlfriend. <laughs> you know, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> Stinks? <laughs> So it encourages him, fires him up. My wife, my girlfriend, she's waiting on me. All right. Well, I got a love letter from Calvary. I got a love letter. I sure did. It's written in blood. And it said, son, look at this. And he wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I said, hallelujah. <laughs> It's in there and nothing can take it out. There's no, no eraser can erase the blood of Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So what do I see when I look at Calvary? One who died for me, one who took my place, one who became sin for me, who knew no sin, and a love letter from God. The greatest love letter ever written to man was written on the cross at Calvary. Would you accept that today? Accept it. Why don't you do that? Some of you need to ask the Lord Jesus into your heart. He'll save you right now if you will. If you'll ask him, he will. He will. He tasted death for every man, not just the elect. Father, in thy name we pray. Use what I've said for the glory of God. In Jesus' sweet holy name and for Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Stand up.